Hi, thanks for tuning in. I'm Michelle Crawford and I'm excited to share another video in my series that's all about teaching you the things that I wish I knew as a watercolor beginner. So stay tuned, plus don't forget to subscribe so you can watch all the videos in this series. Let's get started. Hey, who turned out the light? Oh, hi. There you are. Oops, let me fix this lamp. Ah, that's better. If you're a watercolor beginner who's struggling to add dimension to your flat paintings, then this video is for you. If you haven't guessed it yet, today's episode of Things I Wish I Knew as a Watercolor Beginner is going to be all about teaching you what you need to know about painting light and shadow. So let's jump right into it. You see I've got three very plain objects here. A box, an orange, and a tiny mug. So why would I be teaching you about art with these three objects? Well, we've got three different types of objects here. This is a rectangular prism, which really is just a fancy name for a 3D rectangle. It all could also be a cube in the shape of a square. We also have the orange, which is a sphere, which is essentially a 3D round object. And then we have the coffee cup, which is essentially a cylinder. Look around you. Almost all of the objects that you see in one way, shape, or form are either a rectangular prism, a sphere, or a cylinder. So learning how to paint these objects in watercolor is gonna help you in all your everyday paintings. Let's start by talking about light. What is light? Do you know that white light that we see is actually made up of all different colors of light? When you mix your paints together, you get black. But when you mix all the different colors of light together, you actually get white. Which is why if you put white light through a prism, you get a rainbow. And most of the light that we see every day is white. So let's look at this orange. Did you know that when the light is reflecting off of this orange, the parts that are reflecting back at us are the white parts or the highlights on the orange. But when the light hits the orange and we're seeing, well, orange, the orange is actually absorbing all other colors of light and reflecting that orange light back at us. I know, super sciencey, but stick with me. So depending on the direction and intensity of the light, it will reflect more or less on the object. If I were to concentrate this light on the orange, you should see that the lighter parts getting brighter. If I move the light further away, the lighter part is less intense. So where their light's hitting and reflecting back off, we see color or even white. Where there is no light or where there is, in this case, less light, this is where we're seeing some form shadows on our object on the opposite side of the light. Um, and then we're also seeing a cast shadow underneath the object, which is much darker. One rule of thumb to always keep in mind is where light isn't, there is darkness. Anywhere where the light can't reach, you'll see darkness or a shadow. And that is essentially because the orange is blocking the light from hitting the paper. In this case, because we're on a white background, you also see a little bit of reflection, a light highlight at the bottom of this orange. We won't get too much into that reflection highlight today. Um, we'll stick with the basics, but if you do see that in, in the image, that's why it's because this is on a white piece of paper. White reflects all the colors right back at you, so it's actually reflecting light onto the bottom of this orange. If we were to set this orange on a black piece of paper, you likely would not see a highlight underneath the orange because the black actually absorbs light instead of reflecting it back. Again, super sciencey. But let's move on. The reason why this is important is because each of these different types of objects reflects light in a different way. Let's look first at the rectangular prism. This could also be a cube. Right now, the light is shining from above the box. If we put it directly above the box, you'll see that the light hitting the top is actually reflecting right back and showing a bright white color. The sides, however, right now are in shadow because the light is not able to reach and reflect back as much on that surface. If we move the light to the back of the object, 
so this would be a backlit, you'll notice that the front of the object is very dark and in shadow and our cast shadow is now even in front of the object. We've got less light reflecting off the top, but if we were to take a look at the back, you would see a very bright backside of this box. Let's do the front. So something that's lit from the front and actually I'll lower it a little bit so we get more of a front lit. Um, and so we have light now is reaching the left side the least amount because the box is blocking all of the light from getting to the left side of this box. And the light is now coming down more so in the front than the top. And so the front of this box is actually a lighter color than the top. The top has got a light shadow. So depending on the position and intensity of the light, you're going to see different areas of light and dark on this box. Typically with a rectangular prism like this or a cube or a box, you're going to see the same color um, being across each surface. So this entire surface of the box is all one color. This surface of the box is all one color and this surface of the box is all one color because our sides are flat. Pretty simple. Now let's take a look at the coffee cup, which is a cylinder. So when we have a cylinder that's lit from the top, you can see that this top rim is the lightest part. We see the top of this handle being in highlight and then a majority of the, the rest of the mug is actually um, kind of dark. If we were to backlight it, Again, we're seeing a lot of light reflecting off the rim. The inside of the cup gets a little bit darker and so does the front side of the cup because it's in shadow. But if we move the light to the front, we're gonna see more of the form shadow here. So what's interesting about a cylinder, especially something like a coffee cup that's hollow, is that on the front side, you'll see that the highlight area is on the direct, the side of the object where the light is coming from. So in our instance here, the light is coming from this direction. And you'll notice that the right side of the cup is light and the shadow is showing up on the, form shadow is showing up on the left side here. So we're kind of seeing the darkest part here and gradually as we move across the cup, it's moving into light. However, when you look at the inside of a cylinder like this, it's in reverse. So because the light is able to hit the back of the cup from this angle and less light is being able to hit the inside of this, this side, it's actually in reverse where you can see a shadow on the right side and it gets lighter to the left. And then if we look at the handle here, we see the handle um, again is being lit from the front, but where the, it bends over, we're seeing a bit of a form shadow there as well. And just having a little bit of darkness there would give that indication that this um, handle is kind of folding over itself. And of course we also have our cast shadow. So you can see that where, that depending on, again, the intensity and direction of the light, the cup itself is casting a shadow. And as I move the light around, you can see that, that cast shadow move around as well. So the cast shadows will help um, with perspective if you, if you're, looking at or painting multiple objects in a still life and they just don't look like they're on the same plane, possibly look at your shadows that might be able to help. Of course, also drawing in perspective is going to be important as well. But if you want your objects to look a little bit more realistic, adding these form and cast shadows is going to be real important. In addition to shadows, we also have again highlights. So we're seeing a variation of color from dark to light and on this coffee cup, especially um, there are areas on this handle because it's very shiny and it, shiny objects will reflect more light. And then also on the, the rim here, you're seeing areas where pure white is being reflected right back at you. So being able to add those type of uh, detail highlights to your painting will also help them look a little more realistic. The last object we'll look at is the orange, which is a sphere. And I think this is probably one of the most interesting objects because it is perfectly round. The light is actually going to bend around the object. So when we have round objects, <clears throat> we put the light right on top. If I have the light right above this, you'll see the light is reflecting most off the top of the orange. And then we have this uh, middle area, which is kind of the form shadow. 
And then again, because we are on a white piece of paper, we're seeing a little bit of that reflection off the bottom, but then we've got a really very dark and crisp uh, calf shadow underneath as well. Um, but if you look closely, and if our light is intense enough, you'll also see a bit of that white highlight or pure reflection. And so <clears throat> when we're painting around objects, we'll have where the light is, is most intense or closest to the object will be kind of a highlight and we'll have a, a, a lighter area surrounding that and then it'll get darker as it gets closer to the cast shadow. If we were to light this one from the back, you can see again because the object, the, the light is actually bending around this orange, we're still getting a really um, bright highlight toward the top of the orange. Um, but that gradual uh, blend to darkness is, is uh, much shorter and most of this orange on the front is now in shadow. And if we light it from the front, you can see we get more of the light going all the way across the front of this orange. It's going to bend around, but the area right now, because the light's also coming a little bit from the right, you're seeing this uh, form shadow on the left hand side. And because we're from the front, we're getting a much shorter cast shadow here as well. So there's a little bit of science about how light reflects around objects. Now I'm going to teach you how to put this to practice in your watercolor. We're going to paint a sphere, a rectangular prism, and a cylinder. Okay, for this exercise, I'd like you to grab some high quality paper. No, it doesn't have to be arches, but using 100% cotton, and at least 140 pound watercolor paper for this exercise is going to be really helpful. I'm using some Winder & Newton watercolor uh, paper flock, which is 100% cotton. So today we're going to be painting these three objects and I've got some examples here on the left of what things might look like if you just did one flat wash and ignored all of the form and cast shadows in your subject. And on the right is an example of what we're going to do today by adding light and shadow into our paintings to create lots of form and make these objects become more 3D and just jump right off the page. Don't be nervous, you can do this, it's super easy and honestly watercolor is perfect for creating these type of illustrations. Because watercolor is transparent, the way we make a color lighter or darker is by adding more or less water. So in order to create these different values within our paintings, all we have to do is control the amount of paint and water that we're using and also using a few special techniques to apply them. So let's get started. First, we're going to draw these objects. Super, super simple. Don't be intimidated. Let's go. In order to draw this rectangular prism, we're going to start first with a rectangle. Go ahead and make two uh, perpendicular lines that are parallel to each other and then connect that with two horizontal lines. Now, starting from the bottom left hand corner, go ahead and draw a short line that goes back at an angle and then draw a, a parallel line to that on the top. Do a third one at the right hand corner and now use a vertical line to connect the two on the left and a horizontal line to connect the two across the top. At this point, you have your eraser so you can erase any extra lines that you might have. And voila, you just drew a rectangular prism. Let's move on to the coffee cup. Drawing any cylinder, you typically have two uh, ovals or circles that are connected um, to form the cylinder. So to draw the inside of our coffee cup, we're gonna start with a bit of an oval shape. There we go. We're gonna do another one, um, not too far below that. It can be about the same width or uh, a little bit more narrow depending on how straight or narrow you want your coffee cup. And now go ahead and connect the top and the bottom. We've essentially made a cylinder. Now for our coffee cup, you may want to erase the top of your circle across the bottom because technically we wouldn't see that. It would be on the back side of the cup, but you can go ahead and erase that and then just draw it back in. Then if we want to paint the inside rim of the cup, we could also do um, a parallel curve right underneath the back 
that rim and then follow that around so you essentially have an oval inside of your oval. Super simple coffee cup drawing, doesn't have to be perfect. We're learning all about how to create the shading on this object. And then we have the handle. You can essentially just do a C shape and then another one inside of that, trying to keep the kind of the thickness of the line about the same. And a little trick here is this handle is going to kind of bend over as it comes around. The easiest way to kind of um, trick that in your drawing or trick the eye is to start on the inside curve and as you're coming around the corner, just kind of transition your line to the outside. Now you'll see that you have it uh, outside and it kind of looks like it flips over. If you want to erase any lines, feel free to do that. Kind of adjust your drawing. And now we're ready to go. There's our coffee cup. Super simple. And lastly, we're going to draw our sphere. This may be the most complex object to shade. However, it's the easiest to draw. We're gonna go ahead and draw a circle. That's it. <laughs> the rest we're gonna do with our paints. While we're here, I think it's also important to kind of um, think about where we're going to put our cast shadows as well. And again, kind of guessing where these go isn't always the easiest. Sometimes it's just best to look at a reference photo to kind of figure out where they are. Um, but let's start with um, our rectangular prism. In the example here, you can see we kind of have a sh shadow on the left side that's taking the contour of you know, what the shape of the, the block might be from the side. So to draw this, we're just going to start with a line about a third of the way up the back side and take that out a little bit. And then we're going to take that line now kind of parallel to the this bottom edge here and then connect it in the front. So again, depending on the position of the light, that shadow is gonna move a little bit. And for what we're doing, we really just have to like kind of indicate that the shadow is there. It doesn't have to be perfect. All right, so now for a coffee cup, um, the shadow kind of starts at the bottom corner of the cup because our light's again coming in from the top right. And then I'm gonna kind of mark where it ends here and then it goes out to about here. Um, again, I, I uh, checked the reference photo when I um, did this first drawing. So now I'm just gonna kind of connect those with a bit of a curve and voila, there is the outline for our cast shadow. It's gonna be very similar here with our sphere. Um, I think we'll start like just kind of in the middle of it here. Again, light directions heading this way, coming from the top right. Um, it will come around here and this one's gonna be a little bit more kind of narrow of a curve. There we go. We kind of want it to come around and connect And there we go. Now we have a cast shadow for our sphere. I hope that was simple. If, if you wanna learn more about how to draw, I totally recommend that. Um, there's lots of great channels on YouTube and it's always gonna improve your artwork. So let's get to painting. I'm gonna start with my rectangular prism. And for this, um, it would I could paint this in like a light gray to kind of depict the white box that we looked at in our reference images, but uh, honestly, I think that's gonna be a little bit difficult for you to see here on camera. And so I have picked uh, the color purple. So we're gonna start, this is like a good practice for making uh, medium light and kind of a, a darker value of your paint. So you wanna start with about a medium wash. I've got a little bit of mauve mixed in with dioxazine purple and I've added some water to it. I kind of have this nice medium wash on my brush um, I could also take my brush and just dip it a little bit in my water jar quickly and then uh, remove some of the excess. But this is gonna be our, our lightest wash when we add that water. And we're gonna paint the top of our rectangular prism, this nice light purple. And you can pick any color you want here. It's just important that we get three different values of the same color. Just fill that in. Remember on our rectangular prism, um, even though the sides themselves had different values and different, were different saturations of color, um, each side itself was pretty consistent. So paint that whole top side one light wash. And in order to move on to the rest of this, we do want that to dry so we don't get any mixing and blending of colors. So right now we're gonna move on to the coffee cup. 
The first thing um, I want to paint with the coffee cup is the inside of the cup. So you can see here in the first example, if we just paint it one color, it looks really flat, but um, the outside of the cup, because our light direction is again coming in from the top right, and the left side is in shadow and the right side is in highlight, but on the inside of the cup, uh, if you remember from earlier, we'll see that in reverse, where the dark side is on the right, the side that the light is on, and that's going to move over um, to being less shaded on the left. So again, you could just use um, some water with this uh, because it is white and we can have white paper. If you want to be able to see it a little bit, you could add maybe a little bit of uh, yellow ochre or yellow to your brush and just kind of like add some water so you have at least a little bit of pigment. It's kind of a cream color, um, but that inside oval that we painted, let's go ahead and fill that in. Again, a really, really light wash, not a lot of color, but we want to make sure that this stays wet. So even if you want to go back into your water jar and just grab some color, it looks like I might have picked up a little bit of pink there. That's totally fine. It's still a really light wash. Okay, and now that that's nice and wet, now I want to add in that little bit of a form shadow. So the shadow color we're going to use today, you can grab a Payne's Gray, or you know, if you even have like some type of a black, we're just going to take take a tiny amount of it, and then we're going to water it down. Okay, and I've got this nice light wash, and I'm just going to take this inside of our cup is still wet and it's going to kind of start to drop it in that top right uh, area of this oval. And you'll see it's going to kind of naturally start to move and blend all on its own across this cup. If you want to clean up any of your edges, um, just use a really light touch to kind of um, move that around. But this is where you really want to just let watercolor be watercolor and let it do its thing. Um, and we want that to be a nice light value on the left. If it does move a little too much on you, um, you might have used a bit too much water. You could always um, clean your brush, dry it a little bit on your paper towel so it's clean and damp and just kind of um, lift some of that on the right. And then if you want even uh, more of a shadow, you can just go right back in um, to your color and drop, while this is still wet, uh, even a little bit more to make it more dynamic and add even more contrast to your contour shadow. So we're going to go ahead and let that dry. And I think we can move back to our rectangular prism. We've got our light washed down on the top of this box. Our light is coming from the top right. So that top edge is the lightest. We're going now into our medium wash, which we've already got mixed up on our palette. We're not going to add any water here. We're just going to go straight in and paint that next front facing side. One flat wash of this medium color. I flipped over my page just so I don't get my hand in the wet paint on our coffee cup. feels a little too light to you, you can always dip your brush right back in and just make sure you go over the whole area uh, to make sure it stays evenly wet. And there we go. There's the front side of our rectangular prism. Now let's move on back to our coffee cup. I think that's mostly dry. Uh, let's go ahead and paint our handle. So this cup is going to be kind of a, a turquoisey color. I've got the color aqua green, which I really like. So I've got some of that on my palette here. And we want to go in, again, using wet on wet. So we want to make sure we've got a decent amount of water. But we're going in with a light wash and we'll drop in color. So let's first do um, just the handle. So go ahead and fill that all in with a light wash. This is a small area, so if you end up with a little bit too much water on your brush, you can always kind of sop that out. So I'm gonna dry off my brush and just kind of like pick up a little bit of that extra water so it's not pooling. There we go. And if you remember, we had a shadow right here where the handle of the cup kind of bent over. So I'm going right back into my paint gray. I just grabbed a teeny tiny amount of it on my brush and I'm just gonna like tap right here 
Again, this is still wet. Um, it's not moving as much as I was hoped, so I'm just kind of cleaning off my brush. And I'm gonna move that around a little bit. Can wipe my brush and kind of blend it. Um, if you lost any of your blue, you can feel free to add some of that back in. There you go. Teeny tiny little amount of paint. You're letting the watercolor do its thing. You're gonna drop that in and just let it be. While that's drying, <laughs> we're gonna go back up here to our rectangular prism. We've got one more side to paint. This is gonna be our darkest side. So um, last time we used the wash that was on our palette. So this time we're gonna wanna go and grab a little bit more paint to make this even more concentrated. So I'm getting a darker color here. And now we're gonna go and paint that third side, the dark side with this Darker, darkest wash. Fill it in. And just like that, all of a sudden, the shape looks pretty three-dimensional. Again, you wanna kind of make sure you get the, your paint down and then let it settle. Um, once this dries, if any of our uh, sides or we think too light or too dark you can always go back in with another layer um, but if you go and mess with it now you're probably gonna like muddy things up a little bit so um, let's go ahead and let that dry and we're going back to our coffee cup so the next uh, part we're gonna paint here that top room we're gonna leave it white it was pretty much white in our reference so now we're just face focused on the body of this cup here and we're gonna have our, our form shadow on the left we're gonna be highlight on the right we wanna have that kind of gradually flow across the cup. So the easiest way to do this is to grab the medium wash of your color. And I've got a pretty dark color, so to get my kind of medium wash, I do have to add a little bit of water. Okay, now the dark side is on the left, so I'm gonna start on the dark side by painting right up against that whole edge. And then I'm gonna start painting across, pulling over to maybe about a third to a half of the way, depending on you know, your reference and how much light you have hitting this object. Um, your form shadow might move around, but now I'm just kind of adding some water to my brush and going in with mostly clean water and using my brush to spread that pigment across the rest of the cup. You'll see I'm getting a much lighter uh, version of this color by doing this technique and I'm able to keep everything wet while I'm working. Just pull that over. Um, and we definitely ended up with a light side and a dark side. This will continue to move and bleed as you're working. Um, again, embrace the watercolor, let it be watercolor. Um, but once it starts to kind of settle a little bit, uh, maybe wait you know, 20, 30 seconds after you've laid down your wash, we can actually go back in with um, a, again, a small amount of paint, highly pigmented paint on our brush, not too much water, and then just barely touch that left side. You can even just kind of like uh, blot it a little bit and it'll just start to move. You can see that we're able to get an even darker value there on the shadow side of the cup. Things aren't moving around for you quite as much as you would like and things are still wet, you could um, do some blending a little bit, or you can just wait and let this dry and again, do another layer. If I might try to just move this around a little bit just by washing off my brush, drying it, it's mostly dry, and I'm just using a very, very light um, pressure to kind of pull, scrub at this a little bit, pull a little bit more of that color, washing my brush off again. And just mainly want to keep this evenly wet so that we don't get any harsh drying lines. And then if it ends up getting, um, I've got a lot of wash over here. Again, you can use a damp brush to kind of pull up some of that pigment and regain some of your highlight. As long as things stay wet, you're always in the clear. And so, feeling pretty good about that. If you want an even darker shadow, you could go in even with some straight pigment 
a really highly concentrated pigment. Again, just the very, very tip of your brush and kind of dropping that in along that top edge. There we go. A very three-dimensional coffee cup. All right, we'll do the cast shadows last, but right now let's move on to our orange. So with the orange, if you don't add any uh, form shadows, it really just looks like a circle. So how do we get this nice 3D effect with the orange? Well, you're really trying to make sure that you have a nice uh, gradient wash going across um, the object. You've got a, an area that's um, your highlight area, kind of a round area that's the lightest, and then you have a medium value, and then you'll have the darker value, um, and of course our shadow. So in order to do this, we're gonna go start in with a medium wash, um, and I'll show you a little trick to get this looking just perfect. So um, I've got just a little bit of cadmium orange mixed with cadmium yellow. This is kind of a, a medium wash, and I'm gonna start by on the dark side of my orange, putting a little bit heavier color. But with the tip of my brush, I'm also gonna kind of outline the entire object because we will have those medium values all the way around the object. And then I'm gonna fill in starting from that left dark side. And once I get kind of uh, that first darker circle created, I am going to dip my brush in my water, tap it on my, on my cup, and then start to spread that color around to fill the rest of the shape. Now, again, because we're trying to keep this all nice and evenly wet, and watercolor is going to move and blend, once you put down these washes, um, if you just kind of like sit and wait, you'll be able to watch the color move across the object and create form as it goes. Now, we do wanna make sure that we're getting a little bit more form in our object. So once that is already blending and settled down, we're gonna take our most pigmented um, paint and again, just around the edge, that dark edge of the object, we're gonna start dropping in even more color and creating that form shadow. The hardest part of watercolor, I think is always patience. And when it comes to these types of um, wet on wet blending techniques, patience is always going to be important. Anytime something like this is happening and you don't like it, um, try to leave it and let it be. Or you can, again, wash off your brush and you're just using that very, very tip of the brush, lightly scrubbing uh, the paper to kind of blend and move that pigment around. As you work, you can always add more, I would, more pigment if, if things get a little too light for you. Um, of course, you're always gonna add that from the shadow side. We can even test that out here, adding even more contrast and dimension to our object. We do wanna have that go around the full object. I've got a clean damp brush here, just trying to blend this out. So it's not a nice, it's not a harsh edge. It's gonna be a nice evenly blended kind of gradient wash and keeping everything nice and evenly wet this whole time. Again, if you lose some of your highlight, you can always um, lift as well. But this is a great technique for being able to quickly add form and dimension to some objects. Drop a little bit more of that pigment and maybe you can go straight into the paint and get even more saturation and shadow on my object. All right, now we're gonna let that dry and move over to our cast shadows. We've already drawn our cast shadows, so they should be fairly simple. All we're gonna do is make um, a really light wash of our dark value. Again, I was using Payne's Gray. Um, you could use your black or whatever else you have on hand. So it's a really light wash. And now that these images are dry, we can go ahead and just paint that right where we uh, laid out the pencil lines earlier. Try to get a nice uh, even wash on that as well. There we go. There is the cast shadow for our rectangular prism. Go ahead and do one here for our coffee cup as well. Filling that in, 
super simple once we've drawn it there. Then our orange is still a little bit wet, so I am going to use my heat tool to dry that uh, really quick uh, before I move on. And now that that's dry, I'm going to go ahead and paint in my cast shadow. Grabbing my light wash, filling it in. I mentioned a lot of this is just letting watercolor be watercolor. And when that happens, you're going to get all kinds of different blends and bleeds. And sometimes um, when you don't want them, hard edges could form. I feel like that happened a little bit here on my orange <laughs> right here um, where I think I was explaining and not working quickly enough. You can see here um, I have a little bit more of an even blend here. So if this does happen to you and I've already dried this, um, you can fix it. So now that the paint is dried, I could go in with a clean, damp brush. And it's right here, I feel like we have kind of a hard line. It would be a little bit more gradual or more of a gradient um, in real life. And so I'm just kind of re-wetting the shape. Again, you want even distribution of water. Otherwise, that's really what causes um, the hard edges. And so I'm just going to kind of re-wet everything, blend it around a little bit. And now I'm feeling a little bit better about um, not having that hard edge. Even at this point, if it's re-wet, you can always go in and drop in more color. Um, it really is up to you how, how dark and dramatic you want those shadows to be. Um, but I hope you learned today how easy it can be to use watercolor in some wet and wet techniques or sometimes just making sure you're using different values of, of one color to create some really interesting objects that are not only three-dimensional, but they seem to jump off the page and create a lot of interest in your watercolor art. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If so, don't forget to give me a, a thumbs up. And if you'd like to keep up with the future content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thanks, happy painting.